Right. Here's another USMLE vignette, kind of related to Cartagena syndrome. A newborn child with failure to thrive and abnormal IRT. What is the likely chromosomal abnormality? Go ahead and type in the number that you think is implicated in this disorder. What number is going to be implicated? I see a seven. If you're thinking IRT related to cystic fibrosis, you're absolutely correct. It's gonna be chromosome seven. This is what we actually test in the newborn screen. On the newborn screen, we test the immunoreactive trypsinogen. If you have an elevated IRT, that suggests that you may have cystic fibrosis and you may need a confirmatory test. Remember that in cystic fibrosis, it is going to be a mutated CFTR gene that causes a misfolding of a ATP-gated chloride channel. Remember, channels are proteins. So a gene defect is going to lead to a misfolded protein, most commonly. What gene defect is important for us to recognize? Remember, the delta F508, which is going to encode for, at the 508th position, a deletion in phenylalanine. So what is the difference in sweat glands, CFTR, and other exocrine glands? Let's go through the normal. The normal is, is that sweat glands normally, as you have more sweat, they reabsorb chloride. And exocrine glands, as they secrete, for example, lung juice, i.e. mucus, the lung CFTR ends up opening the chloride channel. And rather than reabsorption, there's secretion in exocrine glands. And that's why the CFTR gene in the lungs, for example, is encoded to help thin secretions downstream by releasing the chloride into the ductal lumen. In cystic fibrosis, you can't in the sweat glands reabsorb. And that's why you have salty skin and you have an abnormal sweat chloride test. And in the GI tract, in the pancreas, in the lungs, in the exocrine glands, you have a failure to secrete that chloride and thus you have very thick secretions. Okay, excellent. So USMLE vignettes for cystic fibrosis. A teenager with cystic fibrosis who now has elevated blood sugars and elevated hemoglobin A1C. What is the likely mechanism? Well, remember that patients with cystic fibrosis can have the tendency to have an exocrine gland defect. They're gonna have thick, thick pancreatic secretions. And subsequently that can cause you to have an endocrine pancreas insufficiency such that you can develop secondary diabetes. Because remember the beta islet cells, insulin is going to be within the actual, um, uh, within the actual pancreas. Now, how would an exocrine, not an endocrine, but an exocrine pancreatic insufficiency present on the USMLE? Well, steatorrhea, because you're not reabsorbing your fats. You're going to have malabsorption, foul smelling stools, hypoproteinemia, as well as a deficiency of fat soluble vitamins. Let's integrate some GI real quick. Ready? A cystic fibrosis patient has an abnormal DEXA scan or a bone scan. What is the likely mechanism here? And that is going to be abnormal vitamin D metabolism and reabsorption that leads to osteopenia or osteomalacia. And so here, what we did was we started with cystic fibrosis, went through the cellular, went through the endocrine pancreas, exocrine pancreas, tied in some GI nutritional deficiencies. This is how you're going to learn. And remember, all of my other reviews on my YouTube channel, on my courses are in this integrative fashion. So what we want to do is we also want to tie in some microbiology related to cystic fibrosis. As you can see on the left-hand column, there are going to be many different bacteria. And with these bacteria, you need to recognize that patients with cystic fibrosis can be colonized or be infected with these bacteria. Why? Because they got thick, thick secretions in cystic fibrosis and bacteria just love to chill on thick secretions. Thick secretions are like a glue for staph aureus to stick. And so remember that staph aureus on your USMLE, they'll say gram-positive cocci in clusters that are going to be catalase and coagulase positive. And these patients with cystic fibrosis typically are going to have staph aureus infections early on, whereas pseudomonal infections are going to be in the adulthood. 
Pseudomonas aeruginosa is going to be a gram-negative bacilli that is going to be oxidase positive. Remember that you want to use aminoglycosides, especially inhaled formulations of aminoglycosides, to decrease the pseudomonal colonization and CF exacerbations you can have due to pseudomonas. So what are your aminoglycosides? Ready? One, two, three. Gentamicin, neomycin, amikacin, tobramycin. And remember that aminoglycosides are going to be 30S ribosomal subunit inhibitors. Aspergillus is going to present in CF patients as asthma-like symptoms, recurrent pneumonia. Remember that they can have eosinophilia because it's a fungal, fungal mold species that has acute 45 degree branching. And then finally, if a cystic fibrosis patient is going to have a very pervasive necrotizing pneumonia and sepsis, you're going to be thinking about Burkholderia cepatia, which is also a gram negative bacteria. And so this chart just shows us right here that Staph aureus is going to peak in the young. And as you can see, it's like around six to 10, whereas something like Pseudomonas aeruginosa is going to peak a little bit later on. Let's go ahead and integrate cystic fibrosis. From a respiratory standpoint, these patients are going to have nasal polyps, and nasal polyps are going to be bilateral in cystic fibrosis. Uh, and remember that in aspirin intolerant asthma, they're also going to have nasal polyps. So differential is going to be aspirin intolerant asthma. Pneumonia can cause a breakdown of your basement membrane epithelium, and thus you can get bronchiectasis. And bronchiectasis can lead to obstructive lung disease. You can also get hemoptysis as well, because now all of that tissue in your lung is friable, such that when you have a forceful cough, you're going to, bam, pop open blood vessels. From an MSK standpoint, you're going to have digital clubbing. From a genital urinary standpoint, these patients are going to have thick, thick secretions in their GU system. So think about obstructive azospermia. They may even have an anatomic defect, which is going to be vas deferens going to be absent. And from a GI standpoint, they can have meconium ileus, which we talked about, as well as in adults, because of the thick secretions, they can have distal intestinal obstruction, such that here is the colon. And you notice that right here where the star is, there's a mucus plug. And that's why the small intestine is not lighting up. And so that's known as a distal intestinal obstruction. And this presents as acute abdominal pain in a patient with cystic fibrosis, and they are going to have bloating as well as colonic dilatation. 